evening, everybody. My name is Mary Bingham, and as you all know, I am the nine times great-granddaughter of Sarah Wilds, and I am the one that records all the videos for this particular YouTube channel. So this is part two of Sarah Wilds, the story of a colonial woman. This is the Topsfield years. In the words of a beloved TV character and one of my personal favorites from the Golden Girls, Sophia Petrillo, picture it, Topsfield, Massachusetts, 1663, a farming community incorporated 13 years prior and today home of one of the most successful annual fall fairs. It is located along the Ipswich River with its highest point being 280 feet above sea level. The Wilds lived on a farm which covered about a three mile area. Their house stood at the junction of Meeting House Lane and Perkins Row. As stated earlier, Sarah came from a middle to lower class family and definitely married up on the day of her marriage. This is known because John Wilds was awarded 20 acres of common land two years before he married Sarah. And a few years later, he then paid a fairly decent sized tax rate, which demonstrated a fairly good income. John was not only a farmer, but a successful carpenter who was very active in town affairs. Also to be considered was the size of his family upon his marriage to Sarah. In 1663, there were a total of eight mouths to feed. So, as stated earlier in part one, John needed a wife to tend to his young children and the necessary household chores. I want to apologize Actually, John's daughters were uh, aged in age, uh, ranged in ages from three to 12 years old. Unlike uh, in part one, I state that they were up to 10 years old. That is not true. Sarah Wilds Bishop was actually uh, 12 years old at the time of Sarah and John's marriage. So I do apologize for that. There aren't any court records depicting ill will between Sarah and her stepdaughters. One thus may conclude she had cordial relationships with them as they grew into adulthood. Maybe even special bonds with Priscilla and Martha, who were so young when Sarah became a permanent fixture in their lives. After all, it fell to Sarah to teach these young ones in the Christian way and the necessary chores to prepare them for adulthood. It has been previously recorded that the relationship between Sarah and her eldest stepson, John Wilds Jr., was strained. However, one might conclude this as hearsay because it is only evidenced in one deposition that Reverend John Hale gave at Sarah's trial in 1692. John Hale says that Mary Reddington told him that John Wilds Jr. thought Sarah was a witch. Did her stepson really think this? There are no court records pitting John Jr. directly against Sarah. One might also review the relationship between John Wilds Sr and John Wilds Jr. for a glimpse at John Jr.'s relationship with Sarah. The first thing of which John Wilds Jr. considered in his will he made before he went off to war was that he had already received what was rightfully his from his grandfather Zacchaeus Gould. John Jr. made sure this would happen this happened, actually, so that his own father would not be accused of any wrongdoing by the Gould family, who were cousins to the Putnams. Furthermore, John Jr. appointed his honored father and his loving uncle, John Reddington, 
showing allegiance to both sides of his family. One more equally important consideration is that John Jr. referred to his much younger half-brother as his brother in his will. He did not refer to Ephraim, the only son of Sarah and John, as a kinsman, which was traditionally the case with more distantly related persons back in those days. So one might wonder if John Jr. would indeed accuse the mother of his much younger, supposedly beloved brother as a witch. I will leave it to the listener to decide. How about the even more important relationship between Sarah and John Sr.? Sarah probably took on the role as deputy husband upon their marriage. John may have been away from home often as he was active in town affairs. Sarah was left to take care of business in his absence. John would have had to entrust her to take care of any needed administrative affairs. Not only that, she may have worked side by side with the men in the fields when required in addition to the other duties of which she was required to take care. They may have had assistance from her evil relatives who lived next door. There is zero evidence thus far that the wilds had either indentured servants or slaves. As far as their personal lives, Sarah and John shared many joys and sorrows together. They would have experienced joy when John's daughters were married. Hopefully, Sarah was proud of the woman they became through her example. They would have experienced the joy at the birth of John's first grandchild in a time when only some lived to see their grandchildren born. And John, between the children of his first marriage and uh, his second marriage, would have had 26, about 26 grandchildren in all. So no doubt Sarah and John's greatest joy together would have been the birth of their only son, Ephraim, in 1665. Sarah was then 38 and John was 47. The heartbreaking sorrows, no doubt, included the deaths of John's eldest, eldest sons in 1676 and 1677 as a result of King Philip's War. Also the death of his daughter Priscilla Lake, who died only three weeks after her infant child was born. As previously stated, Sarah, I'm sorry, as previously stated, Priscilla was very young when Sarah came to live with her. Sarah may have experienced this death in particular, like a death of one of her own children. It was about 1674 when gossip started to percolate. It was also the time when nine-year-old Ephraim had his mother's back. As brothers John and Joseph Andrews deposed against Sarah in 1692 at her witchcraft trial, they were mowing when one of their sighs broke in 1674. They went to the wild house nearby to ask Sarah if they could borrow one. And Sarah said, we don't have one to lend. A neighbor who overheard the boys told the boys that John Jr.'s was hanging in a nearby tree. So aside from Sarah, the rest of them um, decided that John and Joseph would go take that one, return to Sarah, and tell her they would ask John Wilds Jr. to borrow it as he was in a nearby field, then go back about their own business. Sarah sharply replied, it would be a brave world if everyone did, but they will. John and Joseph disregard Sarah. As they walked away, Ephraim runs out after them, yelling, my mother said you best bring that sigh back or it will be a dear sigh to you. 
Again, they ignore Ephraim and eventually complete their mowing. Returning the side to John Jr. The Andrews brothers were teenagers at this time, and it may have taken a lot of courage for Ephraim to run after them, not knowing how they would respond to him, a kid. John and Joseph mowed the three loads of hay and had trouble getting the last two loads back to their home in Boxford. They had issues with the cart and the oxen who became spooked by a dog-like creature, violently driving the cart down a dangerous hill into Mile Brook. Now I'm going to bring you ahead to Mile Brook and what it is today. Mile Brook is actually on Avil property on Perkins Row, not far from the boundary line of where the wilds lived. So if you're standing on the beautiful bridge that overlooks Mile Brook today, if you turn all around, you see all the hills. There are steep hills going down into the brook. And um, the uh, history of Topsfield, that wonderful book that George Francis Dow um, wrote, I want to say lack for a better term, he's the one that depicts that that is the exact precise area where this particular scene took place. And if you turn around, you see all those hills, you can see where a, a cart would come violently going down, traveling down into that particular brook. So, <clears throat> Eventually, going back now to 1674, eventually the uh, Andrews brother ma uh, make their way home after dark to a very worried family and friends. John and Joseph deposed in 1692 that they believed Sarah Spector was responsible for these mishaps as revenge for them using the scythe. The incident was etched in the minds of other family members of the Andrews, so much so that five years later, in 1679, Sarah was confronted by John and Joseph's mother, Grace Andrews, who was on her way to visit her friend, Mary Reddington. Grace recounted the incident to Sarah, who remembered telling the boys that they could not borrow the sigh. But Sarah did not know of the mishaps that occurred when they tried to get the hay home. Grace probably referred to Ephraim telling them to return the sigh or else it would become a dear sigh to them. When she demanded to know why, Sarah threatened her sons. And Sarah said, I will make you prove it. Sarah was most likely threatening legal action. But Grace called to her daughter, Elizabeth, to be a witness to the rest of the conversation. As Sarah turned toward Elizabeth, Elizabeth started to shake so much so that she couldn't walk. Elizabeth experienced other uncomfortable sensations later that night while trying to sleep and believed that Sarah Spector was the cause. She then referred to Sarah as an old witch the next morning when she spoke to her husband about the incident uh, the previous day. There was also another time when Elizabeth collapsed in the meeting house about a month later after the previous incident. So Elizabeth collapsed in the meeting house when Sarah passed by. Elizabeth was carried off to the parsonage where she finally came to believing that Sarah caused the collapse. Elizabeth told these stories as part of her own written deposition against Sarah at Sarah's trial in 1692, explaining that since 1679, she was so ill that she could not do for her family at times, blaming Sarah all the while. And in addition, Elizabeth tells in her writes in her deposition or has written for her in her deposition that she would have traveled to Salem to testify in person herself but she was too ill to do so at the time in 1688 Ephraim who was 22 years old now was actually engaged to one of Elizabeth's daughters 
However, hmm, he got wins that his future mother-in-law accused his own mother of being a witch. Ephraim, who brought along his friend Mark Howe as a witness, confronted Elizabeth. Elizabeth denied the gossip, telling Ephraim that she only knew the gossip told by Mary Reddington. Ephraim didn't believe Elizabeth and swiftly broke off the engagement, leaving Elizabeth extremely angry with him. So, who was Mary Reddington? <clears throat> Mary was born into the affluent Gould family and was the sister of John Wilde's first wife, Priscilla. The cause of her intense dislike for Sarah is unknown. Maybe she heard of Sarah's earlier court cases mentioned in part one and disapproved of Sarah raising her sister's children. In addition to visiting Reverend John Hale at Beverly for spiritual guidance regarding those issues with Sarah, Mary also told the following story to her brother, John Gould. Mary was traveling home via horseback with her husband's brother when she fell backwards from her horse, not once, not twice, but three times into a brook. Mary managed to get up the first two times, but needed help the last time. She claimed to have been pinned down in the brook and required the assistance of her brother-in-law, as well as Edmund Town, who lived nearby. When John gets ready to actually write the story down for his sister, Mary can't declare it. Hmm. So now John Wilde's was fed up with these stories and decided to head west a few yards down Perkins Row to threaten a lawsuit against John Wilds on behalf um, John Reddington. John Wilds threatens the lawsuit against John Reddington on behalf of his wife Mary. So many Johns here. <laughs> John Reddington asked John Wilds not to do that as it would be a great cost to his estate. On the other hand, John Reddington said that Mary would stop her gossip in time, that he never knew anything against Mary, any, that John Reddington never knew anything that his wife Mary had against Sarah. Not satisfied, John Wilds then asked his friend and current brother-in-law, William Averill, to go talk to Mary Reddington. Mary does talk to William, and she again denied her gossip. Mary never admitted her gossip to anybody when her feet were held to the fire. There is yet another story as told um, by Mary Reddington, and she tells the story about her nephew, Jonathan Wilds, who was John Wilds Jr.'s younger brother, <clears throat> and she says that Jonathan Wilds killed some of her hens. Mary asked Sarah to take some of the dead hens, and she would keep some that were still alive. Sarah agreed to help her out and to do this for her. The hens that Mary kept supposedly became ill, then died some time later. And then Mary said, and so shall I. One may assume that Mary suffered from some form of depression as a result of her own illness and needed someone on whom to place the blame. Sadly, Mary died sometime before 1679, blaming Sarah for her illness to her dying day. The next story offers a glimpse into Sarah's relationship with her God and gives credence to what Ephraim will say in his petition for Sarah's ex uh, exoneration about 20 years later. Sarah taught him well in the Christian tradition. In 1679, Reverend Jeremiah Hobart of Topsfield filed a lawsuit towards Thomas Dorman on his wife, Judith's behalf. Judith accused the minister of sexual harassment 
and having an affair with Mrs. Simons. According to Judith, Jeremiah should have been removed immediately. One day, Judith approached Sarah and asked her if there was a biblical verse regarding Moses standing in the gap. Sarah replied, yes, there is such place, meaning a, a statement in the Bible. Judith then said there was a Moses in the Hobart's household, or else the wrath of God would have destroyed him. Sarah explained that there were many untrue statements said about Mr. Hobart. Judith believed that Mr. Hobart was a sad man and said that if others knew what she knew, not one more person would join the church at Topsfield. Sarah reminded Judith that even David, a man after God's own heart, was a sinner. And Judith concluded, if we fall with David, we must rise with David. So Moses, standing in the gap, refers to Psalm 106, verse 23, when Moses petitioned God on behalf of the Israelites and stood in the breach to keep the wrath of God from destroying them. The fall of David refers to 2 Samuel 11. After David's throne had been established, the enemies were held at bay and the temple at Jerusalem was about to be built. For some reason, David chose to have an affair and arranged for the woman's husband to be eradicated from earth as a cover-up. David realized his horrendous sin and turned back to God though he still dealt with the consequences resulting from his sinful behavior. Sarah seemingly understood the minister as she was a victim of vicious slander at that same time. So let's fast forward to 1689. Ephraim, now 24, married to his beloved wife, Mary Howlett. In 1690, John handed the deed to the farm to Ephraim, including the house and all of the outbuildings, for two following reasons, as stated by John. His natural love and affection for his son, and that Ephraim worked the farm, may be serving as an apprentice for his father for seven years, when he could have started to earn some of his own income. It was the same year when Sarah experienced the birth of her first grandchild when she was 63 years old. Back in those days, the firstborn child was more often than not named after their parent. Ephraim and Mary broke with tradition. They named their first child a son, John. One might wonder if Ephraim and Mary did this out of love and respect for his father, who was now about 72 years old. They then return to tradition when their next child is born in 1691, a girl they named Mary. In the early part of 1692, Ephraim assumed his elected office as constable of Topsfield and was expected to enforce criminal and civil laws. He had to answer to the Marshal of Salem, amongst others, and you will see why, and why I say that in part three. It was shortly after this appointment that the circumstances for this family turned quite dire indeed. Please subscribe to my channel and click the notifications button. Part three will chronicle Sarah's sad and horrifying journey to Proctor's Ledge as John and Ephraim demonstrated unwavering love and support to the bitter end. You may also enjoy the first video in this series, Sarah Wilde's Story of a Colonial Woman, Part One, The Ipswich Years. You may also like Sarah Averill Wilde's Childhood lo House Location, the Sydney Shercliffe River Walk at Ipswich, which is a beautiful area today. And you may also want to watch the final journey 
a walk from Federal Street to Proctor's Ledge, which depicts my own personal walk um, from the former site of the old Salem jail to where the 19 were hanged um, behind Walgreens at Proctor's Ledge. Thank you very much for taking the time to listen.